once again, Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world, more particularly to all Shepherds Rod believers. May the good Lord bless you and have a wonderful evening. Here in track number 6, page 3 and page 4, it says, Since there is only one truth, and since no two sects are in absolute agreement as to what it is, naturally, not all can be right, but all, save one, must be wrong. And here in 1 TG number 2 on page 21, From this we see that Jesus is the only way to the kingdom. The idea then that there are many ways, whereas there is but one Jesus, and that they all lead to the kingdom eternal, is only a hump of a humbug that unsanctified hearts like to listen to. They are of those who are dodging the porter at the door, of those who know that their deeds cannot stand inspection. So the voice of inspiration plainly telling us that since there is only one Jesus and Jesus Christ recognizes only one denomination here in 1SR 242 it says for he recognizes only one church as his so God recognizes only one church as his church and to repeat again here in 2SR 125 it says God has never had more than one movement in existence at a time, and it could not be otherwise now, for Christ cannot be divided. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 13 God's church is well marked in every generation by obedience to present truth. 2SR, page 125 So, since there is only one church, one movement, one sect, that God recognizes as His church, then we need to ascertain clearly what group of people, what church, what movement at this present time that God recognizes as His church. In Por Symbolico 10 to 12, on page 2, the church in prophecy. Por Symbolico 10 to 12, page 2, the church in prophecy. In page 3, for symbolic code 10 to 12, page 3, it says, All must honestly agree that to leave the church out of prophecy at any time is illogical and also impossible. For God has never left His people in darkness and He surely would not do so now at the most important time in the world's history. For symbolic code, 10 to 12, page 3. And since all of us fully agreed and accept that the last church in the New Testament succession is the house of David, the eight church, or concerning the candlesticks, it is the golden candlesticks in Zechariah chapter 4. And it is also called as the 11th hour church in Matthew chapter 20. Because in 2SR 225, it says, Therefore, the vineyard is the world and those sent to labor in, in it are the church. The parable cannot refer to one literal day of 12 hours into which God has made five calls for laborers in the vineyard world. For there is no record where God raised five church organizations in one day and have them operating all at the same time. 2SR 225 So in this reading, we can clearly see that the parable in Matthew 20 is pertaining to the five church organizations. The five distinct calls represent five church organizations. And I know that we as the median already familiar that the first call is the Jewish church, the Mosaic movement. And the second call is the Apostolic Church. And these two churches, the first call and the second call, is represented according to 2SR 284 as the two candlesticks in Revelation 11 verse 3. Now let us read 2SR 284. It says, Therefore, the two candlesticks represent the Old and New Testament churches, Jewish and Christian. 
and the two olive trees are symbols of the Old and New Testament Bible, the Word of God to Zerubbabel. These two witnesses shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days from 538 AD to 1798 AD, cloth in sackcloth. Revelation 11 verse 3. The two witnesses represent the scriptures of the Old and New Testament, according to Great Controversy, page 267. Thus we have a candlestick for each of the two sections of God's church while the scriptures were being written. One candlestick and one olive tree to the Jewish church, and one candlestick and one olive tree for the apostles. So to repeat again, the two candlesticks in Revelation 11 verse 3 is also represented by the two first call in Matthew 20. The first call is the Jewish church or the Mosaic movement and the second call is the apostolic church. But why is it that the other candlesticks are not included in Matthew 20? more particularly to the four great denominations, the Lutherans, the Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists. And we call them the Protestant churches. Now let us read here the explanation given by the Shepherd's Rod. So here in 2SR on page 227, it says, The six and ninth hour calls. Again, he went out about the sixth and ninth hour and did likewise. Matthew 20, verse 5. Each of the calls being at intervals extending over the entire day, it is evident that they must come one after another at different periods. On each occasion, there must be a call, meaning message. If so, it cannot be merely a call of reformation, obedience to a former message. Therefore, the reformation by Luther could not be considered here, for it was only a revival to the message delivered before his time. Said Luther, the judge shall live by faith. Knox, Wesley, and Campbell could not enter in the parable, for they too had only a call for reformation. Obedience to the message or doctrines delivered to the Gentiles by the early Christian church, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit by Knox, grace by Wesley, and baptism through immersion by Campbell were taught by the apostles. We shall present further fruit from another angle to show the above stated reformers are not included in the parable. So, there are uh, four candlesticks in this subject in Matthew 20 by which they were not included in the parable in Matthew 20. And more particularly to the Lutherans, Presbyterian, and Methodists, and Baptists. Why? According to our reading, it's so because the five distinct calls they must have a message by which they themselves had been discovered the message. It had never been thought by any other company previous to their generation. Or in other words, it could not be a message of repetition. Now, I would like to read first here in White House Recruiter pages 17 and page 18. So let us read a statement here. Another point of significance of which we should take note is the fact that the messages borne by these first two groups by ancient Israel and by the early Christian church were not of a reformatory nature. They were not old, forgotten truths in process of revival and restoration. Rather, it was a new revelation meet in due season, present truth especially adapted fully to meet the needs of the people in their respective times. The former group were inspired and commissioned to teach and practice the truths of salvation as embodied in the ceremonial system. The latter group were inspired and commissioned to teach and practice the same immutable truths in their advanced life, advanced from typical to antitypical representation, from the ministration in the early tabernacle to the ministration in the heavenly one, that is, from the sacrifice of a lamb of the flock to the sacrifice of Christ himself the Lamb of God. Thus, the latter group taught the old truths in a new and original light, in the light of the gospel, that Christ was crucified for the remission of sin, resurrected in triumph over sin and death, and ascended to make atonement and reconciliation for the penitent sinner, not in an earthly, but in an heavenly 
tabernacle. And then it says, since the messages of the first two groups, the one carried by the Exodus movement and the other carried by the Christians, were each in their respective times pressed from glory. That fact logically establishes itself as a divine precedent and pattern for all the messages of the parable. Accordingly, each of the three remaining groups must likewise be entrusted with a message of new and distinctive revelation of meat in due season, truth adapted especially and fully to meet the needs of God's people at the time then present. Therefore, we need only to trace down through the annals of church history and unfolding of the school till we come upon a newly and original revealed and proclaimed truth subsequent to the message of the first advent of Christ. It must point out the servants of the third call. The Protestant Reformation being purely an endeavor to restore old downtrodden truths and not to reveal new advanced ones had no new message of its own, nothing that had not already been thought in times past. It therefore follows that the third group and message must be sought during the years following the Reformation. Now let us analyze closely, brothers and sisters, since you are already familiar with this subject concerning the parable in Matthew 20. First, according to 2SR 225, there are five church organizations or the five distinct calls. Matthew 20 represent five church organizations. And the absolute question is that, why is it that the Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists, in spite of the fact that they were God church, why is it that they were not included in the parable in Matthew 20? The definite answer given by the shepherd's rod, according here in White House Recruiter pages 17 and page 18, that each group must be entrusted with a message by which such message originally been unfolded unto them and never been given to the time in the past. And since Lutherans and Presbyterian, Methodists and Baptists, they were not entrusted by God with a new message, but rather only a revival of the message that was already proclaimed and teached by the apostles, but had been trodden down by the exceeding great horn, Therefore, that is the absolute reason why they are not included in the parable of Matthew 20. Now, there is another thing that we need to observe. Why is it that in spite of the fact that John the Baptist has a new message by which it had never been teached before his time, why is it that John the Baptist is not a part in the parable in Matthew 20? The absolute answer must be, accordingly, in 2SR 225, the five distinct calls represent five church organizations, and the movement of John the Baptist is not a church organization, but rather it is just an association. Now, we know already that in 1TG number 36, on page 4, this is the statement given by the prophet. It says, let us read. Through verse 3, found fulfillment in the work of John the Baptist, but the verses preceding and also the verses following definitely apply to the people in the latter days and only partially to the people in John's day. Therefore, the truth stands out boldly that the direct fulfillment of this chapter is found in our time, thus making John's work an example of our work, John's work the type, ours the anti-type. 1TG number 36 page 4. So the prophet himself plainly told us that his movement is the anti-typical movement of the movement of John the Baptist. That is why yesterday we already proven with absolute fact that in reality the Bible teaches two typical Elijahs. Elijah the Tisbite and Elijah John the Baptist. But 
beat him, claimed that he was the antitypical Elijah, John the Baptist. And accordingly, one symbolic code, number four, page five, saying that thus making John the type of the Elijah that is to come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And accordingly, type and anti-type should exactly fit. Answerer number 3, page 23. And also, in 1SR Packet Edition, page 73, it should perfectly match both in time and in objective. So the movement of John the Baptist is an association. The movement of Bethihotep is just an association. John the Baptist died. Bethihotep died. Now, let us go back to our study concerning the parable in Matthew Matthew 20. To repeat again, the movement of John the Baptist is not a part in the parable in Matthew 20. As well as the movement of Bithy Hotep in 1930 to 1955 is not a part in the parable of Matthew 20. And we know the, the port call is the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And in Matthew 20, it was predicted beforehand The, the fifth and last call is the 11th hour church. It is not association, but rather it is a church. According to a White House recruiter, page 33, saying, It's the urgency that every 11th hour church member, I would like to repeat again that portion, It's the urgency that every 11th hour church member, So in this reading, proven with absolute fact that the 11th hour is a church. And also stated in 2SR 225 by saying five church organizations. Therefore, the last call, the fifth call, must be a church and not an association. And since all of us agreed that the fourth call is the Seventh-day Adventist church, let's read in 2SR 225. 233, I would like to read a statement. Mark the following point with care. From the ninth hour in 1844 to the 12th or close of provision, there are only three full hours. So here in this study, brothers and sisters, the ninth hour commenced in 1844. And we know that that is pointing to the seventh day Adventist church. Now, I would like to go back to the historical event. We know that the, the movement of John the Baptist, it is represented by just an association. But the movement of Jesus Christ is represented by a church. And that is called the Apostolic Church. And that is the second call according to our reading. And here in 2TG number 16 on page 19. It says, Thus it is that the world was lost in that day. And thus it was that Christ came to redeem it. To do all this, He started a new church organization. In this light, we see Christ, the world's Redeemer, and His mission even more important than we have ever seen it before. So, the Sherbus Rod is very plain that Jesus Christ started a new church organization. So, the movement that had been organized by Jesus Christ, it is a church. But the movement of John the Baptist is not a church, but it is an association. And it's the one who prepared the way and prepare the way of the movement of Jesus Christ. And I do fully believe that this statement in 2SR 275, let me read to you. Let us carefully read this paragraph. You will also note on page 222 that the 430 prophetic years originally applied to Abraham and his seed overlap the 430 of Ezekiel chapter 4. The 430 years of Ezekiel should terminate in 1929 or 1930. But the perfect fulfillment of the prophetic period of Abraham in its antitype is yet in the future. Going out of Egypt. The chart on page 212 and 213 shows its termination in 1930. For as we stated before, it is outlined by the coincidences which perfectly fit the prophecy of Ezekiel. As it is impossible to make a time chart without any date to go by, we have used these coincidences and it is stated that the date is indefinite. See chart on page 133. Ezekiel's prophecy is intended to point forward to the announcement of the predicted reformation and the one through Abraham to its completion is Ezekiel 9. 
Now, I would like to focus to the last sentence here in 2SR 275. Saying, Ezekiel's prophecy, it is pointing to Ezekiel chapter 4. And as far as Ezekiel chapter 4 is thus concerned, the focal point is the movement which arose in 1929 or 1930. And it says, Ezekiel's prophecy, so this prophecy is intended, so the main purpose of this movement, the movement that had been raised by God in 1930, the intention is to point forward to the announcement of the predicted reformation and the one through Abraham to its completion. As stated in the upper portion, it says, but the perfect fulfillment of the prophetic period of Abraham in its antitype is yet in the future. And it says, going out of Egypt. Now, it is very important to understand this prophecy. I would like to connect first the statement in 2SR on page 222. Let's read. In our study, the title is Wheat and Barley, Each for a Penny. And it's concerning Revelation chapter 6, verse 6. And later on, we will prove to you that Revelation chapter 6, verse 6 is the entire Bible. Because the Bible contains 66 books. Therefore, Revelation 6, verse 6 is the entire Bible. Or in other words, if you could be able to understand the true meaning of this symbolical prophecy recorded in Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, then the mystery of God is finished. Now, here in 2SR 222, it says, In our study of the seven seals, we reserve for future explanation of the following scripture. And I heard a voice from the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. Revelation 6, verse 6. Again, we turn the reader's attention to the fact that the voice came from the throne. And then it says, see chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, the price of the cereals is fixed by the great judge. And we know that is God the Father, the great judge. There must be something of great importance in these symbols. For the great Jehovah himself is speaking. What could it be? It says, Weymouth's translation read as follows. A whole day's wage for a loaf of bread, a whole day's wage for three barley cakes. Weymouth translates the penny as a day wage. We believe the words of Jesus justify this. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is an householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. Matthew 20, verse 1 and 2. The penny is the fixed days wage by the householder to uh, householder of the vineyard. Note that the barley is but one third, the price of the wheat. In other words, one goes into the field and gathers only one measure of wheat and receives a full day, a full day's pay, but the other work all day gathers three measures of barley and receives no more than a day wage a penny. The symbols have a very close connection with the parable given by Christ. Therefore, let the reader concentrate on the subject, for here is a truth worth of our earnest attention. So the shepherd's rod is plainly telling us that Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, is closely connected to the parable of Jesus Christ in Matthew 20. And that is why here in 2SR page 225 and 226, it says, With the previous explanation of Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny, we shall endeavor to prove that the symbols point back to the parable of the householder. And Jesus allegorically looked forward to John's vision. If the explanation perfectly fits the parable in the vision in harmony with God's book and law and a present truth lesson is derived therefrom, then only must we accept it as truth. 2SR 225 and 226. So the voice of inspiration is plainly telling us that when Jesus Christ is giving the parable, to the apostles, in reality, allegorically, he's looking forward to the time when Jesus Christ will show the vision to John in the island of Patmos, pertaining Revelation 6, verse 6. 
And at the time when God showed the vision to John in the island of Patmos concerning Revelation 6, verse 6, Jesus Christ is allegorically looking backward to the time when he gave the parable to the apostles. And the shepherd says that if our explanation will perfectly fit the parable in Matthew 20 and will perfectly fit to the vision of John in the island of Patmos in harmony with God's book, the Bible, and God's law, and also a present truth lesson derived from such parable and vision, then only that is the time that we accept it as the truth cometh from God. Now, here's another statement that I would like to read. And 2SR on page 233 and 234. It says, The last first and the first last. Coming back to our text, A measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny. Revelation 6, verse 6. Why is the wheat mentioned first and the barley last? Why not the reverse? Why three times as much barley for a penny to one of wheat? Or why not the reverse? The scriptures are perfect and no flow can be found in them. Therefore, there must be a reason for this order of arrangement as well as for the quantity of each cereal. Barley ripens much earlier than wheat. Therefore, those hard furs must be represented by the barley. Otherwise, the symbol could not be perfect. The barley then represents the Jewish nation. As they were hired first, naturally the wheat must represent the ones called at the eleventh hour. It is marvelous how perfect the scriptures are. So the wheat represents the ones called at the eleventh hour. Then it says, why only two kinds of cereals brought to view? Why not five? The two cereals are sufficient to illustrate the thought and to clear the lesson. But the chief reason for only two is to draw our attention to the first and the last cause. Because reference is made of but two Israels, namely Israel after the flesh, the descendants of Abraham, and Israel after the spirit, the 144,000. But the object of the lesson is for the latter who are hard at the eleventh hour for the truth of the parable has never been understood by any other company. Now, let us analyze closely the, the statement given by the shepherd's rod. First, why is it that God uses only two kinds of cereals in Revelation 6, verse 6? The absolute reason is that the main objective why God uses only two kinds of cereals is to draw our attention only to the first and the last call. The first call, Israel after the flesh, and the second call, Israel after the, the promise or the spirit. But accordingly, the first call is Israel after the flesh going out of Egypt. Therefore, the last call must also be pointing to antitypical Israel, Israel after the promise, Israel after the spirit going out of antitypical Egypt. Now, let us focus our attention to the perfect fulfillment according to 2SR 275 by which still future in the days of B.T. Hotel. Saying, but the perfect fulfillment of Abraham in its antitype, Israel going out of Egypt, is still future. It is one of the most important events that we need to study closely. Now, let me read to you first, here in 234, the last paragraph, 2SR, 234. Now the question, why the voice from the throne said, One measure of wheat for a penny first, and three measures of barley for a penny last will be answered. Human speaking, it should have been the reverse, for by the wheat is represented the last message, 11th hour, and by the barley, the first early in the morning, Israel going out of Egypt. So the first call is pointing to Israel going out of Egypt. So brothers and sisters, then we can easily understand that the last call must be pointing to antitypical Israel going out of Egypt. Now for example, here in 2SR page 237, it says, reason why three hours to a movement. So 
So this is the, the reason why God uses three-hour schedule. It says, The following fact further proves that the church history in this instance is represented by a 24-hour clock dial. So it says, 24-hour clock dial. If the call came to Israel early in the morning at the 12th hour and the day closed at the following 12th hour called the day because the written word of God was in existence for light to the church, then the period that preceded the Bible is symbolically called night. Some may question the evidence for allowing three hours to each incident from creation to the fall of Adam and again to Enoch and Noah. If God worked on the three-hour schedule with the crucifixion of Jesus, so in Matthew 20, the historical event concerning the passion of Christ, the crucifixion of Jesus, is connected to the subject in the parable in Matthew 20. Now it says, if God worked on the three-hour schedule with the crucifixion of Jesus, see chart on page 22, and the same rule was followed in the period called day, then he certainly would not follow another rule in the period called night. The reason he has followed that particular rule is to present to his church the exact time of her history by periods. Now this is the question, brothers and sisters. What church mentioned here that the principal reason why Jesus Christ followed that particular rule, what rule? Three hour schedule is to present to his church for sure that church is the church recognized by Christ as his now we should be God's real people logical thinkers and not by thunders right according to 2 TJ 24 23 and for sure the church mentioned here could not be the church prior to the time when the parable in Matthew 20 was given because they have no understanding how could they obtain understanding to the things by which it was not yet given now, does the church mentioned here is pointing to the apostolic church? I think the answer is found in 234. Let's go back again. In 2SR 234, it says, But the object of the lesson is for the latter who are hard at the eleventh hour. For the truth of the parable has never been understood by any other company. So, whatever the truth concerning the parable in Matthew 20, it had never been understood by any other company except the last call, the 11th hour call, the 11th hour church. And in this reading, in 2SR 237, I think one of the truth of the parable the the eleventh hour servants will understand is concerning the reason why Jesus Christ followed that particular rule three hour schedule and accordingly in 2SR 237 to repeat again it says the reason he has followed that particular rule is to present to his church the exact time of her history by periods now I fully believe that the statement in track number 5 can also be applied in this study. So let us read again the statement in track number 5 on page 34. Fulfilled prophecies are seen therefore to be employed by the scriptures only as groundwork for that part of prophecy which is yet to be fulfilled. Now I would like to repeat again the statement here in track number 5 page 34. Fulfilled prophecies are seen therefore to be employed by the scriptures only as groundwork for that part of prophecy which is yet to be fulfilled. Now in track number 5, page 32, it says, The statements which must shortly come to pass in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, And I will show thee things which must be hereafter, Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, Go to say that the revelation is given with the one particular object in view of showing the things lying not behind but ahead of John's time with reference being made only incidentally to the past in order to lay the necessary foundation upon which to build the future. So that is the statement, brothers and sisters. So the groundwork is used by inspiration or the fulfilled prophecy, which is already a history, is used by inspiration as the groundwork. And the purpose is to lay the necessary foundation upon which to build the future. 
So the statement in 2SR 237, the reason he has followed that particular rule is to present to his church the exact time of her history by periods. So by this study, we can distinctly separate the fulfilled prophecies, which is the groundwork, and the unfulfilled prophecies, which is the particular object in view. Now, I would like to connect this part in track number one. Uh, it will be a series of study, and I know God will not withhold from us the things by which it is necessary to our salvation. And if we are really hungering and thirsting for truth and righteousness. Now here in track number 1, pages 29 and page 30. As the words which Ezekiel was to speak. Because Ezekiel was commanded by God to speak to his people. And he says, as the words which Ezekiel was to speak to his people were found in the book which he ate. The book can be none other than the Bible. From which comes the message culminating in joy, mourning, and woe. Now, who are they, the specific people by which they are the particular object in view that God commanded the sequel to speak to these people? In one is our pocket edition, it says here on page 74, Ezekiel was commanded to engrave a city upon a tile and to name it Jerusalem. The material on which the city was to be engraved, being everlasting, not subject to decay, it denotes that the city in vision is one that will stand eternally, a people that shall never die. One is our packet edition, page 74. So the particular object in view, according to that reading, is concerning the people that they will no longer to taste that. And that is why... Then it says here in 1 is our packet edition, page 58, But now, at the appointed time, he himself reveals their significance to the very people for whom they were originally and especially designed. Thus, by the former things, the world of yesterday, the great and only such typologies has projected the latter end of them, the world of today. 1 is our packet edition, page 58. Now, let us go back again, brothers and sisters, to... And this very important event pointing to the fulfillment, the perfect fulfillment in its antitype, Abraham growing out of Egypt, by which, according to the shepherd's rod, it is still future in the days of Bitty Hotep. Now, let us now focus our attention to that very important event. Now, here in 1SR, on 1SR page 64, the question is, who is Israel by the promise? And I think uh, all of us could easily answer this question. There are the living saints, the 144,000 spiritual Israel, living saints, the saints that will no longer to taste death. So let us now read the statement here. This experience of the Israelites in departing from Egypt was written for the instruction of those who should live in the last days. Before the overflowing scourge shall come upon the dwellers of the earth, the Lord calls upon all who are Israelites indeed to prepare for that event. Volume 6, page 195. The twelve tribes of Israel after the flesh are but a type of Israel by the promise, the 144,000. As there were Gentiles among Israel, the type there would be Gentiles in Israel, the truth. Now, I would like to focus to that statement that all who are Israelites indeed are the true Israelites. Brethren, we need to prepare for that event. What event? Departing from Egypt. Now, here's another statement that I would like to uh, read here in 1SR, page 101 and 102. What is the number of Israel? It has been made clear that Israel after the flesh is a photograph of Israel by the promise. And it says, in the Exodus movement, all the tribes went out of Egypt. If this is a photograph of Israel by the promise, then all the twelve tribes must come out now as well. Twelve tribes must escape the ruin of Ezekiel chapter 9, death of firstborn, and Isaiah chapter 63, the Red Sea. The number of them is said to be 12,000 from each tribe, making a total of 144,000. For the reason that they have passed through a similar experience as ancient Israel, they, the 144,000, sing a new song of Moses in the Lamb. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea with a shepherd of his flock? 
Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him? That lead them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them to make himself an everlasting name. That lead them through the deep as an horse in the wilderness that they should not stumble. As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord goes him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. Isaiah 63 verse 11 to verse 14. This scripture cannot refer to another company than the one we speak of. 1 SR page 101 and 102. Now, the shepherd's rod is very plain, brothers and sisters, that if the photograph, Israel after the flesh, they went out of Egypt, then Israel by the promise, the 144,000 living saints, must went out of Egypt as well. But the mere fact that according to 1 SR page 64, that those who are Israelites indeed, they need to prepare for that event. What event? Going out of Egypt, by which the shepherd's rod plainly declared in 2SR 275, it is still future in the days of Bethlehem. Now, what is the purpose why God followed the three-hour schedule? It was already answered by the shepherd's rod in 2SR 2037. The reason that God followed the three-hour schedule is to present to His church the exact time of her history by periods. And that statement is pertaining to the groundwork and the particular object in view. Now, the groundwork is the type. The particular object in view is the anti-type, brothers and sisters. So, can we be able to ascertain clearly now what history by periods that we are now living in? And the most important period, the particular object in view in that study in Matthew 20 is the last call. Brothers and sisters, right? The reason why God uses only two kinds of cereals is to present to His church or to draw our attention to the first and the last call according to 2SR 234. But accordingly, but the object of the lesson is for the latter who are hired at the eleventh hour. For the truth of the parable has never been understood by any other company. And for sure, brothers and sisters, the reason that God's people in the past had not been able to understand the truth of the parable in Matthew 20 because God did not unfold unto them. Or in other words, Jesus Christ did not present to them. Why? Because they are not the particular object in view. The particular object in view are the saints who are hired at the 11th hour, brothers and sisters. And for sure, the history and the prophecy is pointing to first Israel after the flesh going out of Egypt. But it is pointing to the anti-type rather than the type. Now, I would like to go back first to that reading in track number 5, page 32, concerning Revelation 1, verse 1, and Revelation 4, verse 1. Now, here in 2SR, 2SR 191, it says, The door he saw open is the veil between the holy and the most holy. For there is no other that had been kept close. Therefore, the word hereafter in chapter 4 verse 1 means from the time of the vision pointing forward to 1844. Now the particular object in view in reality is from 1844 onwards. For example, I would like to read to you here in 2SR page 235. Give them their hire. Note that those who were hired last were paid first and the first last. As all were equally regarded, the ones hired first murmured, though they were paid in full. Their disdainful act denotes that the Jewish nation was unworthy of their hire. And as the good man said to them, Take that thine is, and go thy way. As ancient Israel is represented by the first call, as previously explained, to them the words apply. And as they were the ones who murmured, it proves the parable correct. Why were the first paid last and the last first? Answer. The pay God's servants received is eternal life and is characterized by the penny. 
Therefore, those who are granted the assurance of a never-ending life first are those who are hired last and according to the parable. It was the company called at the eleventh hour. They are those who are marked or sealed by the man with the writer's inkhorn of Ezekiel 9. Or as John calls him, the angel with the seal of God, and he sealed or marked 144,000. See Revelation chapter 7. This glorious company is the first who are granted assurance of never tasting death. See the Shepherd's Rod, Volume 1, pages 22 to 24. Thus they are paid first, but those who were called early in the morning, Israel after the flesh, are to be resurrected righteous when Christ comes in the clouds, at which time they shall be given immortality. So that the last shall be first and the first last. For this reason, those who were sealed and saved by the third angel's message since 1844 are resurrected in a special resurrection before Christ comes. See Daniel 12 verse 2 and early writings page 285. Now think it thoroughly, brothers and sisters. If you are familiar concerning the subject, the harvest, in 31 AD, there is already a multitude of captives that had been granted immortality. And they were already in the heavenly sanctuary. So if you will apply the generation from 1844 backward, then it is no longer reality that the very first that had been granted immortality is the 144,000 living saints. Because historically, there are many, many souls that have been granted immortality even the time when the 144,000 living saints were even born. And that was in 31 AD, according to the Bible and the spirit of prophecy. And Apostle Paul called it in Ephesians 4 verse 8 as the multitude of captives. And they ascended to heaven together with, with Jesus Christ. So to repeat again, brothers and sisters, this is the first reason why the, the parable of Matthew 20 is pointing to the particular object in view, which is the antitype rather than the type. And in 1844, can be exactly fits and perfectly months in the vision in Revelation 6 verse 6. Because at that time, there will be only two grains, barley and wheat. Because if you will apply the parable to the groundwork, which is not the particular object in view, if the barley is the Jewish nation, the Jewish church, then what grains can we apply the Millerites movement? Because the Millerites movement is a part of Matthew 20. We have the, the Jewish church, the first call, and the second call is the apostolic church. How about the apostolic church? What grain? Are they represented also by barley? And then, how about the Millerites movement? What grain? Are they represented also by, by barley? Remember, Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, there are only two kinds of cereals, barley and wheat. And we will prove to you as we proceed in this study that this prophecy, the focal point, is pointing from 1844 onwards. By which from 1844, the remaining call must be barley and wheat. And the barley is the antitypical Jewish church. And that is the Seventh-day Adventist church, brothers and sisters. The Seventh-day Adventist church. Now, I would like first to read to SR 111. It says here, The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation were written especially for the generation living at the time of the end, and not so much for the Roman world, say Daniel 12 verse 4. When does the time of the end really begins? Now let us read first the old symbolic code. Here in the old symbolic code, three symbolic code, number 8 to 10, page 12. It says, When does the time of the end begin? And when was the book of Daniel open? Is it wide open? Answer. The angel who instructed Daniel declared that the book would be closed until the time of the end. Therefore, in the time of the end, the book must be opened. The word does not say that the book is open either at the beginning or at the close of the time of the end, all at once or a little at a time, but simply in the period of the time of the end. However, history proves that the prophecies of Daniel were not all revealed at once, but slowly. The fact that we as yet do not understand the whole book proves that some parts of it are yet closed. Also, the fact that a large part of it is now understood makes it evident that we are living in the time of the end. This time must have begun when the book began to be opened, but if we must declare 
The beginning of that time, in more specific terms, it in a spatial sense began in the year 1844. The time of the end is the period just before the end of the world. So the Shepherd's Run says, in more specific terms, the time of the end began in the year 1844. Now going back again in 2SR 111, it says, The book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, not only the book of Daniel, not only the book of Revelation, but both book of Daniel and the book of Revelation were written especially for the generation living at the time of the end and not so much for the Roman world, Daniel 12 verse 4. They had no understanding of the writings that pertain to the last days and thus could not have profited by them. You see, 2SR 111, the people living prior to the time of the end, 1844 backward, they had no understanding concerning the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. Therefore, they had not been profited. Now, how could they be able to understand Revelation chapter 6, verse 6, while that book was not yet opened, brothers and sisters, or that period of time, the book was not yet unsealed? Now here in TG number 7, pages 3 and page 4, it says, Daniel was told to shut and seal the book even to the time of the end. The book therefore was not for the understanding of the people before the time of the end. So then when the book is unsealed and understood, we may know that the time of the end is come. So the voice of inspiration says that the book of Daniel as well as the book of Revelation was not given for the understanding of the people before the time of the end. Now, to repeat again, brothers and sisters, whatever the truth of the parable in Matthew 20, it had never been understood by any other company except the company of the 11th hour, the people who will no longer to taste that. And how much more to the people living prior to the time of the end? Brothers and sisters, they have no understanding concerning the parable of Matthew 20. Now, I would like to read again in 2SR 234. But the object of the lesson is for the latter who are hired at the 11th hour. For the truth of the parable has never been understood by any other company. Now, this one thing, before we continue, brothers and sisters, concerning that very important event, Israel going out of Egypt or the living saints going out of Egypt, we already explained that there are movements which is of God by which they were not included in the parable of Matthew 20. First, the four great denominations that had been raised by God during the dark ages of religion. Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodist, and Baptist. And according to the Shepherd's Rod in 2SR, as well as in White House Recruiter, page 17 and page 18, and also in 2SR, page 227, the parable in Matthew 20 must be its call. They must have a message by which never been understood by any other people previous to their time. And the reason why God did not include the Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists because they have no message of their own that they themselves discovered. They are only reviving the message that had been forgotten or the message that had been trodden underfoot by the exceeding great horn. And those messages that they uh, teach was already teach and discovered by the apostles prior to their time. And the only message that had never been understood by the apostles is the book of Daniel. And that is Daniel 8, 13 and 14 concerning the 2,300 days and nights. And the reason that they did not understand because they were living in a time prior to the time of the end while the book is sealed. And that is the reason why the third call is the Millerites movement according to White House Recruiter, page 17 and page 18. Now, brothers and sisters, we know that in Matthew 20, I think verse 5 and 6, that is the only uh, verse by which God uses the conjunction end, 6 and 9th hour. And the Shepherds Rod explained that there is a close connection between the Millerites and the Seventh-day Adventist Church because Elijah White and her associates is a part of that movement, the Millerites movement, by which when they experienced great disappointment in October 22, 1844, those that had been left 
they organized again according to 2 TG 15.6 and renamed Seventh-day Adventist Church. And the Seventh-day Adventist Church had been granted new messages by which such messages had never been understood by William Miller. Or the statement given by the Shepherd's Rod here in White House Recruiter. Let's read White House Recruiter on page 18. Since the messages of the first two groups, the one carried by the Exodus movement and the other carried by the Christians, were each in their respective times pressed from glory, that fact logically establishes itself as divine precedent and pattern for all the messages of the parable. Accordingly, each of the three remaining groups, and who are the three remaining groups? That is the third call, the fourth call, and the fifth call. Each of the three remaining groups must likewise be entrusted with a message of new and distinctive revelation of meat in due season, truth adapted especially and fully to meet the needs of God's people at the time then present. Therefore, we need only to trace down through the annals of church history the unfolding of the scroll till we'll come upon a newly and original revealed and proclaimed truth subsequent to the message of the first advent of Christ. It must point on out the servants of the third call. And that is pointing to the Millie Rights movement. It had never been teached prior in the time past. It says, The Protestant Reformation being purely an endeavor to restore old downtrodden truths and not to rebuild new advanced ones had no new message of its own, nothing that had not already been taught in times past. It therefore follows that the third group and message must be sought during the years following the Reformation, and that is the Millerites movement, according to the next paragraph. Now, think it thoroughly, brothers and sisters, these evidences that had been given by the Shepherd's Rod. First of all, to repeat again, the reason why the Lutherans, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists, although there were church organizations represented by uh, Smyrna, Pergamos, Theatira, and Sardis, there were church organizations, but the absolute fact is that the reason that they could not be a part in the parable of Matthew 20 because they have no new message that had been entrusted by God to them. They are only reviving the message that was already taught by the apostles. And the divine principle is that the each call of Matthew 20, they must have a message entrusted by God to them by such message never been thought by their predecessors or in the times past. Now, we already explained why is it that the movement of John the Baptist, in spite of the fact that John the Baptist entrusted a new message, but still he, he and his movement is not included in Matthew 20. Because according to 2 S.R. 225, the five distinct call represent five church organizations. And the movement of John the Baptist is not a church organization, but an association. And the antitype is the movement of B.T. Hotep, 1 TG 36, page 4. So, even though B.T. Hotep has a new message and that entrusted by God to him, still the movement of B.T. Hotep in 1930 to 1955 is not a part in Matthew 20 because his movement is not a church but just an association. But the most important part in this study, brothers and sisters, the last call, the 11th hour church, Therefore, they must have a message entrusted by God to them by which such message had never been teased and never been given by God to the time in the past. So to say, brothers and sisters, that the message of the 11th hour is only a repetition of the message that had been already teached by B.T. Hotep in his days from 1930 to 1955, then the 11th hour movement, which is the focal point of the parable in Matthew, 20, they have no new message of its own and it is contradictory to the parable. If there is a new message of the first call, new message in the second call, new message in the third call, new message in the fourth call, how much more in the fifth call by which they are the object in view, the particular object in view. So in this study, brothers and sisters, we can prove again that the 144,000 living saints or the generation, the last ordained ministry, the 11th hour church, 100%, they have a message by which such message never been understood by any of them who experienced grave and death, grave and resurrection. If the living 
saints will only repeat the message that had been thought by Bethlehem in 1930 to 1955, then there is no distinction. But in reality, the shepherd says the comparison is with the dead rather than with the living. So, this declaration in 2SR, page 172, brothers and sisters, for sure, whatever this truth, it had never been understood by Bethlehem Hotel. Now, I would like to read again 2SR 172. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. 2SR 172. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps and they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Revelation 14 verse 2 and 3. The song was sung in heaven by heavenly beings before the throne and before the beast and the elders. Therefore, it is evident that the judgment was in progress. It says further explanation to follow. Note that the 144,000 did not sing, but they only could learn the song as it was sung in heaven. That is, they alone understood the heavenly truth in that particular time and their position in connection with the message they must be what particular time that is the time brothers and sisters the period of the judgment that pertains to the living bios bt hotem says that that period of time was still future in his days here in track number three in page 43 it says as the cleansings called for in the parables and in malachi's prophecy have never taken place the investigative judgment of the living is obviously then yet future Track number 3, page 43. And in that period of time, when the judgment of the living is in progress, there is a new truth, heavenly truth, by which that heavenly truth never been understood by any other company, those people who experience death, grave, and resurrection. And it is in perfect harmony, perfectly corroborating to the parable of Matthew 20, by which, in reality, the focal point of the parable is the 11 hour call, the last call, by which they must have a message original, fresh from glory, never been understood, never been thought by any other company except the 144,000 living saints. So brothers and sisters, to repeat again, one of the most important events that we need to prepare according to 1SR page 64, is the fulfillment when God's people will depart from antitypical Egypt. Bagus Bithyotev says that it was still future in his days. But how about in our days? So the statement, brothers and sisters, in 2SR 237, the reason why God, Jesus Christ, followed that particular rule, three-hour schedule, is to present to his church the exact time of her history by periods. And that period is more pointing to the time when they will depart from Egypt. So by studying the subject of Matthew 20, the subject of Zechariah chapter 6, Chapter 4, Revelation chapter 6, we could ascertain clearly the definite time when we will depart from Egypt. We'll continue the subject and may the good Lord bless you and have a wonderful day.